All right, so some of the thoughts on the laboratory monitoring for JAK inhibitors, and I shall say the language, I think, in the package insert is a little vague, so you may see there's some variability even among the different clinicians on what they may do. So this is just kind of one thought. So initially, TB, CBC with diff, CMP, viral hepatitis, LFTs, and then, then there's the asterisk ones, which are, you know, as sort of clinically indicated. We talked about the vaccinations. Try to, try to get them all the vaccinations possible before you start, consider the Zoster vaccine. Um, as well. Follow up uh, CBC with DIF CMP at, so here, four to 12 weeks intentionally there because some people may do it at four, some people may do it at 12. Next part may be also a little controversial. Should you repeat them annually or every six months or you know at what intervals? I feel like our field is still trying to gain comfort with these medications. Um, TB definitely annually. Something that's not uh, that's not here. Also, um, triglycerides, right? Yeah, lipids. So lipids. Um, so I think uh, something that uh, you know to to be considered. I think it does make a lot of sense to if you are to check lipids to consider checking them at baseline and then repeat. And you don't necessarily have to check fasting lipids these days. I don't know. You know, most of my patients when they come, they they haven't fasted. So um, so uh, non-fasting lipids typically is okay as well. Just wanted to see if they're variabilities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned it before, when they're older, I'm gonna do it more frequently. And um, this, their, their cytopenias occur. You can, you can lower your white count, and there's no way to know that's happening until they get an infection, right? Or they get zoster or something. So I try to probably do it at the first month to six weeks to see where it goes, and then the next one two months, and then the next one three months, and then maybe three to six months there. I. I I find annually it's just, it's gonna, I'm gonna miss something if, if I go that long on it with these drugs. I'm sure a year from now or two years from now we'll be saying something different. Yeah, mm -hmm. agreed. Yeah. We, did, we covered this. Yeah. And this is the uh, Opsilora ruxolitinib label which has all the black box warnings. It has to do with systemic absorption. When you go a little further down the Opsilora label, it says patients treated with oral um, uh, Janus kinase inhibitors have experienced all these things, it's true. Then when you go to pharmacokinetics, um, which is 12.3 in the label, they'll talk about the maximum use study of Opsilora. The maximum use study the patients put it on 25 to 90% of their total body surface area twice daily for a month, and I had the serum levels me um, measured. And when you were putting on that large surface area, you were getting serum levels like the Jacophy label. Jacophy is oral ruxolitinib, and they looked pretty similar. So then I scoot back up to the top where it says, don't use it on more, don't use more than 60 grams a week or 100 grams in two weeks, right? And for vitiligo, it's 10%, not 20%, and it's an absorption thing. That's, that's all it is. So if you reduce the body surface area, you're gonna reduce the risk of any significant systemic levels. I think we did that. Exactly. Okay, so I, we, we covered this, but it, it, this is my, this is my um, cross-examination to Dr. Armstrong for the, <laughs> the itch in the 12% BSA. Look at the numerical rating scores for itch and the dynamic nature of how far they came down at the first few days and then by, you know, day seven and day 14, they're really, really down quite a bit. And that's mean change from baseline. So a numerical rating score of itch for seven is going to wind up with a three or four, a four, um, in the first week or two. And the MCID, you know, the minimal clinically important differences are about a three to four on this. So the patients will notice the difference and feel good about that difference. Any questions on atopic dermatitis before we move into our next section? Yep. Are 
Yeah, that comes up. Um, I probably wouldn't do 200 of Abro or 30 of UPA and use this, because then you're really pushing your luck on the dosing. Now, remember, uh, Rinvoke um, has a dose of 45 milligrams for inflammatory bowel disease, so we do have room there. But I, I think at that point, if you're 30 milligrams of Rinvoke or 200 milligrams of Sabinco, and they're not doing that well, and they need topical rocks or something like that, you've got one, a very unusual case. You know, you're in the top one hundredth of one percent of your AD patients, and you may want to either switch, add a biologic drug on to that, because um, we do that sometimes, or add phototherapy. But on the lower doses, intermittent use, we do it. But remember, that is specifically um, contrary to the, um, not the warning, but a, a sort of a suggestion to avoid that. So we have a couple questions uh, on AD that are coming through the app. Okay. So I'll, I'll pose them to the panel, um, just to, we can make sure we've answered them. So thoughts on females on oral contraceptives and starting a JAK inhibitor. So I think the question is, is do we have a concern about a cumulative uh, risk for uh, blood clots or DVTs um, by uh, having patient concomitantly on JAK and an oral contraceptive pill. I, there's some data on that that it doesn't look additionally cumulative, but what you do have to realize is that birth control pills substantially increase your risk of DVT. Even though they're rare events, you, you get more DVTs when you're on birth control pills. and. It, it's a tricky one because sometimes they're not told that when they're put on birth control pills. It's like a very flippant thing to put someone on a birth control pill and no one tells them like, you can't smoke on these things, particularly if you're on Yaz or Yasmin, like don't smoke with these. Your risk could be five or 10 times greater than the general population. And, and by the way, like they haven't had any problems for three years on, the, on, on a birth control pill. You start them on a jack inhibitor and they take a trip to Singapore on an airplane and coach, and they get a DVT, guess what? That's all yours, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's all, you, you own that one, right? But you have to warn them about that. But I'm not sure there's enough data to say there's extra risk, but they are at risk for DVT. And like in the EMA, that's a level of concern for yours, for you to consider. Yeah, and, and I think in the, uh Jack uh, inhibitor, oral Jack inhibitor studies, they had, uh, they had a good proportion of uh, females of childbearing age on birth control pills, and then they have not seen a disproportionately increased rates of DVT. Now, those are rare events, of course, so we'll, we take that into consideration. So I think it's about like the number of hits, as, as Devo was saying. So, you know, while earlier we say, oh, maybe occasional smoker, you know, smoking a few on the weekends or vaping, you know, may, maybe that's okay. But if you, you start to add them together, then your risk, cumulative risk does increase. So it's important to then refer to that sheet about, you know, screening patients. And so knowing like how many ticks they, they answer positively will, will start to kind of, you know, you have a limit, right? You're like, ah, maybe, maybe this patient with these risk factors combined then makes the patient not as good of a candidate. But, but that birth control by itself I think right now is probably okay. So what about a patient with a history of blood clots but completely stable on an antiplatelet therapy? Would you consider a JAK as an option for their atopic dermatitis? I would say not first line. No, no, for no, sure. no first line. Would, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it can't be first line. It has to be someone who has failed any available biologic drug. That person I'd likely put on cyclosporin and, or, or methotrexate uh, as an adjunctive therapy. And if they failed that, um, maybe give them a sample bottle. Talk, you gotta talk to the hematologist about this one. Because the, the question is, what is the proximate cause of their clotting issue, right? right? Yeah. Because they're all different. You know, sometimes like people have an accessory rib and they clot in their subclavian, right? And it's, it's physical, the reason they clotted, right? Or they had some 
AV malformation that made them clot, and, and that's, that's mitigated by the, by the uh, antiplatelet drug as opposed to an inheritable clotting disorder. Or they've had a history of a stable cancer, but that gives them hypercoagulability. So it's, it's a tough one. The answer is never, never. It's not, no, it's a, I have, I have 85 year olds with every cardiac risk factor on jack inhibitors. They're just a complete mess, right? And they're stable on, and I get them controlled under this. They're not the ones you wanna have in your practice on a regular basis. Because it's a lot of anxiety associated with uh, doing those. It's okay to refer those, by the way. <laughs> the, the last question on, uh on a topic before we leave was, um, patient on Dupi um, who's flaring while on Dupixent, would you consider uh, pulse dosing with a jack to control those flares? I think it's a very, if you can get it, it's, it's, it's a very reasonable um, use of a combination therapy just to get through some of those flares. I wouldn't do it if we had that patient who like on day uh, 10, or day nine keeps flaring, because that's a lot of, you, you really should just updose at that point. But if you're getting seasonal flares, people do get v seasonal flares, they get sun-induced flares, um, they, you know, they know they're gonna go into a situation that makes them flare up for a couple of weeks, yeah, that, I think that's very reasonable. I think so too, it's sort of substituting the oral steroids, right? Yes, with a With a jack inhibitor or substituting your cyclosporin with a jack inhibitor to control these kind of occasional flares. Yeah, off-label, hasn't been studied, but um, probably makes sense. All right, we're going to pivot to the next section on alopecia areata. So this is actually one of my patients. This was a patient that was started on baricitinib She's a 45-year-old female, and you can see her before and after photos. So the after photos there were taken at about nine months. All right. Looks like uh, Barrison changes the hair color too, huh? I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Well, that's called ombre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about one of the newer uh, treatments for alopecia areata, uh, ritlicitinib, uh, train name here, Litfulo. And so ritlicitinib actually has a bit of a unique mechanism of action, different from our other JAK inhibitors. It's considered a JAK3 tech inhibitor. So TEC tech is actually this other class of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, it also includes a number of other families, uh, BTK being one of them. Um, so it was studied, um, so, so this, this molecule was studied and was found to be actually um, quite specific for, uh, for alopecia areata and some of the pathogenesis there um, by decreasing um, the, the pathways that, that, that's mediated through JAK3 and TEC and, and decreasing interferon gamma specifically. Okay, clinical things. So it's indicated for the treatment of severe alopecia areata. What does that mean? So you would need to have a patient with a SALT score of at least 50 or above. So SALT score is a way of assessing severity of alopecia areata. And the number that goes after the SALT uh, is the percentage that's, uh, that's involved of the whole scalp. So if the, if the whole area, if you, don't have, if you don't have any growth, then the SALT score will be SALT 100, okay? So SALT score 50, that means you have 50%. So the lower the number, SALT 20, means uh, that you have 20% of hair loss. So you want a low, so it's a number represent percentage hair loss, okay? So, so why that's important because you have to kind of put that in your note to get the medicine for the patient. So you wanna say severe alopecia areata, SALT score of 50 or above, or whatever number you uh, clinically observe, but they're looking for 50. And uh, um, it's in adolescent and, and adults 12 years and older, as you can see here. Um, 
So some of the limitations of use is actually very similar to what we see with uh, baricitinib and other sort of other JAK inhibitors. Um, very convenient dosing of uh, 50 milligrams once daily. Okay, so how did ritlocitinib do? So this is, uh, this, so they're taking people who have at least a cell score of 50, so right, at least 50% hair loss or more hair loss, then they look at them over time, look at what percentage of them achieve what's called near complete uh, regrowth, which is defined as 20% of hair loss or less hair loss or less. So what they found is that it, at uh, six months of time, 23% of the patients achieve that compared to 1.6% of the patients. So it is a high bar, right? Because you're taking people with pretty very severe hair loss and now they have basically 80% of their hair scalp, you know, at least 80%. And so it definitely work. Um, and, uh, uh, but as you can see, you know, with hair growth, people need to be patient, they need to be consistent. So a lot of this is emphasizing consistency over time. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So uh, what are some of the safety uh, profiles specifically with ritlocitinib? So something we're still exploring uh, because uh, at least, you know, when we're thinking about this JAK3 tech uh, inhibitor, uh, we're still, so, so one of the things is that the tech family is very important for your hematopoietic cells. So we look very closely at the laboratory abnormalities for, for this class of medications. And so a few things, you know, you notice um, uh, there's some, you know, rates of urticaria here a little bit increased, slight increasing acne, what you may um, uh, suspect, a little bit diarrhea there. And uh, um, when you are looking at the red blood cell uh, decrease, there, there's a little bit perturbation there. So what does it mean clinically um, when you're looking at advising patients? Next slide, please. Okay. So I think that's, that's all the, uh, we'll go to the previous slide. So um, uh, in terms of advising patient with what we consider for ritlocitinib is uh, a laboratory, you know, so, so the, that, that slide we showed earlier, uh, checking the labs, so that's in their package insert as well. So definitely check the labs and uh, keep an eye out for especially absolute lymphocyte count and platelet counts. Um, in the clinical studies, uh, there were some perturbations in that area, but overall, no, no large ones, but just to making sure, the key is to just make sure that you, we are, I think, you know, as David said earlier, make sure that they don't develop some kind of weird sinopenia during, during the therapy. Um, any thoughts on this to my colleagues? Just my thought would be, you know, you're, when you're looking back at at the, let me go back one slide here, you know, you're still seeing it at 24 weeks, you're seeing this curve yes, going yes, upwards, yes, right? And so absolutely. just really counseling the patients that it's, it really takes time and you probably need to be on it at least, I was, in, in my opinion, a year, if you're not seeing the results, then it's probably not gonna work for them. But I, I tell them right out of the gates, like you're gonna be on this, you know, for sure for a year and it could, it actually could take, sometimes patients don't even respond or have a minimal response like eight or nine months. Mm -hmm. So not every patient has the same response like my patient did where she had near complete growth or regrowth at, at nine months. It's, it definitely can be slow in some patients. Mm -hmm. I, I, the only comment I'd make on these kind of scores is they're really hard to make clinically relevant. You, you'd say, okay, I want to see a population of people who started out with greater SALT scores than 50 and then this population has SALT scores of less than 20, equal to 20. And so 23% of the time that happened. But it's a binary event. The, the person either has a salt of less than 20 or they don't have a salt of less than 20. But it's not talking about the dynamic nature of the change in the hair. Like if you don't see, if you see a completely bald ophiasis pattern at month six, I'm not sure that chart says you're gonna get hair in that ophiasis pattern at month nine. Right? It's basically saying, you know, you give it a couple more months and the 22 becomes a 19 and then you're in. So it, these are sometimes hard to bring right into the clinic and say, I think I know what's going to happen here. I think you've got to look at the patient, get the dermatoscope out and look, do you see hairs coming out of those hair follicles? Are they vellus hairs? Are they, you know, miniaturized hairs? But if each time you see them, there's something new happening there, that's great. 
but I, I'm not sure if you, if you had just completely bold areas at six months, does this chart say those bold areas are going to grow? I don't think it says that. No, but you don't have a lot of other options either. No, right? no, I, I know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, rationalize how we use this data. And so the, I think the end game here is patience is a virtue. It's like watching paint dry, waiting for your hair to come through the surface. But you notice the two graphs start separating at week four, which suggests to me that the drug starts working immediately on taking it, but it just takes time for the hair to start growing and breaking the surface enough for you to see it. Mm -hmm. Right, these mechanisms yeah. don't take long periods of time to work, right? None of the jack inhibitors take a long time, right? The, the tick two, all the jacks and eggs, they work very quickly but itch and eczema is a very fast-breaking disease, whereas this is extreme. This is like you know nails in your hair, watching them grow. Right, right. I, I wanted to add another important point to this discussion is the length of time that patient has had alopecia areata. Yeah, this yeah. is actually super important because um, most clinical trials they require people to their last episode to be less than ten years. So if you have a patient who's had alopecia areata, the last episode for more than 10 years, guess what? Likely they're not gonna see response because um, they likely, their hair follicles likely have all kind of, you know, going from a non-scarring to essentially no activity has, has senescence. So taking a good history of how long, uh, it's, 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 it's the length of their last episode. Because you, you, you'll have people who have like these episodes of alopecia, so it's it's the last one and how long it, it is. And if it's greater than 10 years, you really, first of all, um, if it's truly greater than 10 years and you document that, you may not get this. <laughs> and uh, um, and the reason is because, you know, the likelihood of success is low. And then the, the closer there to, you know, the longer they have, the, the likelihood of success is lower as well. So I just wanted to emphasize that. that that's why you look at, you know, patients that are like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this drug now, we have finally have a drug for you. And they're like, and then you realize, oh no, you've had your alopecia areata for like 20, 30 years, and, and you know, unfortunately, it's likely not gonna help them, so. Great point. All right, so for baricitinib, there's actually, there's two different dosing. So again, it's, it's approved for adult patients, so unlike lit flu, which is for pediatric patients 12 and above, this is for 18 and above. The recommended starting dose is, for, is two milligrams, and you can increase to four milligrams if the response is not adequate. But if the patient has near or complete scalp hair loss at baseline, or if they have severe involvement or involvement of their lashes or eyebrows, you actually want to start them at four milligrams. And then it's recommended to reduce the dose to two milligrams once an adequate response has been achieved. So at baseline in their studies, over half of the patients had at least 95% scalp hair loss. So these were very severe alopecia patients. A third of them had their current episode lasting at least four years. 70% of them had significant gaps in their eyebrow or no eyelashes. And excuse me, I, or no notable eyebrow hair, and 58% of them had significant gaps in their eyelashes or no notable eyelashes. And this is looking at the same endpoint, the SALT score of 20 or less. And you can see in the four milligram dosage, about a third of patients at week 36 compared to about 20% of patients at week 36 on the two milligram dose achieved that SALT score. So significantly higher number of patients are gonna achieve that on the four milligram dosage. But then if you extend out and you look to 52 weeks, you're gonna see that you're gonna capture a few more patients that will achieve that SALT score of 20 or less. And if you up the bar to a SALT score of 10 or less, so these patients have 90% regrowth of their hair, about a quarter of patients on the four milligram dosage at week 36 are going to achieve that. 12% of patients on the two milligram dosage will achieve that. And then again, if you extend it out to 52 weeks, you're gonna capture about 5% more patients in each of those dosages that will achieve that SALT score of 10 or less. 
would you say would you say sir that the four milligrams here when we're that there's no head to head obviously but like the when you're looking at salt score of 20 or less seems like the four milligram is more similar to the uh, to the uh, ritlistinib mm -hmm. 50 milligrams um, more so than the two, two milligrams. Yes. And again, most of the patients in this study you know, had 95% of them had really severe yeah, alopecia. Yeah, so probably the vast yeah. majority of patients, and, and they don't identify, if you go back to the indication, so severe alopecia areata, but it's not, it doesn't tell you, it doesn't really give you guidance on what exactly is a patient that, a two milligram patient versus a four milligram. So you can certainly use your discretion in your dosing.